Welcome to our afternoon session with Dr. McNulty. If you have any questions, we are going to do a special Q&A at the end of his second presentation. So take notes, write your questions down, and then you can ask them at the end. For those on YouTube and Facebook, at least on YouTube, I'll look at the YouTube. If someone can look at the Facebook one, uh, if you have any questions, please enter them into the chat. And I will check that as well periodically during our Q&A, which will happen at the end of the second session. We're about to start our first session. Um, as we're having some technical difficulties, uh, we're going to open up with prayer, sing a song or two, and then at that time we'll have Dr. McNulty continue his presentations. Okay, so where you are, please bow your heads with me as we open up our session for today. Father in heaven, we thank you again for the messages that have been delivered. We trust and we have felt the presence of your spirit among our hearts and among, among us here. As we continue with our afternoon session, I just pray that you would continue to open up our minds and our hearts to be receptive to the message you have to speak to us at this hour. Be with Dr. McNulty as he presents our two afternoon sessions. We thank you and we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, we're going to have a couple of songs from our Marner sisters. Here you go. We will be singing hymn number 453. They come from the east and west, from the old hymnal. Ooh, y'all, take out your phones. <laughs> I don't think it's in the hymnal, um, in the hymnals we have here. But, you know, praise the Lord for advanced technology. We can find these things like this. 453, they come from the east and west. come from the east and west they come from the north and south invited to join with jesus as guest and dwell in their father's house to gaze at his lovely face and clothed with his purity stormy seas they come from the hills they come from the dales they come now O Lord to thee arrayed in his marriage robe their bridegroom so soon to see he who hung upon the cross to win their victory. Here gathers a countless host, redeemed by his grace from wrong. No more any sin, no more any tears, no more any night so long. All things are now passed away. Become as new, joy shall reign eternally, for death is ended too. They come from the thorny path, they come from the stormy seas, they come from the hills, they come from the dales. They come now, O oh Lord, to thee, arrayed in his marriage robes, their bridegroom so soon to see. 
Good afternoon and happy Sabbath. It's been a blessing to be with you already this morning, and I was very blessed by the meal and the fellowship I had during that time. And now we're going to go through a couple of more very important presentations, so I'm glad that you've come back. And um, I, do, I do have to say that, boy, I just had the the best cheesecake I've had in I don't know how long. So thank you, Sister Sabrina, for that. Um, so let's pray, and we will start our afternoon session. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for how you've been with us this morning and through the fellowship meal, and I thank you now that we can go through a couple of more presentations where we can understand where we are at this time in Earth's history. I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. So this afternoon's message, the first one, is entitled The Four Stages of the Sunday Law. But I'm going to, before we get into some statements from Ellen White that take us through the stages of the Sunday Law, I am going to look at some key passages of Scripture to establish the foundation of where we are headed. Now, here's what I want to mention. You know, I find that a lot of Seventh-day Adventists have become very illiterate prophetically. And... You know, I have been a Seventh-day Adventist in the church my entire life. I was baptized when I was eight years old. And when I started hitting my, my teenage years, I started hear, hearing more and more, we don't need to worry about end-time events. We just need to know Jesus. You may have heard that kind of sentiment expressed in a Seventh-day Adventist church near you or so, at some point in your life. I'm thankful that your church here has an interest in these things. You know, here's, some, here's a common misnomer that I've heard people say, or maybe misnomer is not the right term for it, but just a, a misunderstanding of Scripture that people say. You may have heard someone say, I'm not worried about, about what's coming. I just need to know who's coming. Well, you know what? The Bible says that Satan himself will deceive as an angel of light. If you don't know what's coming, 
Satan will be much more easily able to deceive you because you don't know what the truth is when there's a reality that false Christs and false prophets shall arise and will deceive many. Um, so when we go through this presentation about the Sunday Law, if you've been here already this morning, you'll realize that what we did for the Sabbath school time, t showing how Jesus reveals himself through the sanctuary in the book of Revelation, and then what we did for the sermon time, you'll realize that my focus is primarily on presenting Christ and the role of God's people at, at the end of time. And the book of Revelation is the revelation of Jesus Christ, but it would not be surprising that there are two specific chapters in the book of Revelation that reveal Antichrist so that we will understand what Satan does to try to deceive God's people at the end of the world. Now, we, we want to know the, the true, who the true Christ is, but he does give us information about the Antichrist. Now, I will also say this. Sometimes the only thing Seventh-day Adventists know about the book of Revelation is that there's a prediction of a Sunday law somewhere in Revelation 13. And some Adventists know a little bit more beyond that, that there's something called the three angels' messages in chapter 14. But listen, friends, we need to know a lot more than that. The other thing I'll say is this. If you were asked to give a Bible study to somebody outside of the Seventh-day Adventist faith today, showing them from the Bible only that a Sunday law is coming, would you be able to do that? So what we're going to do at the beginning of this presentation is I'm going to show you from the Bible only why we believe a Sunday law is coming. And once we establish that from the Bible, then I'm going to take you through the spirit of prophecy to show you the stages of the Sunday law as they come. So this is going to be a, a Bible study that establishes clearly from Scripture that a Sunday law is coming. And then I'll show you from the spirit of prophecy how that will unfold. Does that sound good? Okay, so here's what we're going to do. We are going to go to Revelation 13. And Revelation 13 will give us this picture of where we're headed. Now, if you've been here already this morning, you'll see what I did with the, the development of the sanctuary message through the first half of the book. But I will say this as well. So we have seven churches in the first three chapters of Revelation, seven seals in chapter 6 and also chapter 8 verse 1 you have the introduction in chapters 4 and 5 and then you have the seven trumpets in revelation 8 through 11 and through that development of the churches the seals and the trumpets we see that from the most holy places god god is working from the most holy place god is working to develop a people so that in the laodicean church which is the church of the most holy place of the churches he takes a church that is lukewarm and helps them to overcome as christ overcame from the seals we come to the end and we see that the 144,000 receive the seal of the living god from the trumpets we see that the mystery of god is finished christ in you the hope of glory so that as you see this development through the book of revelation it's like, wow, this is what God plans to do to defeat Satan and the great controversy. He goes through history, and when he gets to 1844 and to the most holy place, he develops a people who will be like him. That takes us through the churches, the seals, and the trumpets. And those people who are like him receive the seal of the living God. The mystery of God is finished. This is how God is going to win the great controversy. And you finish that, and you're like, wow, this is amazing. What an awesome study. But you have to remember there's a great controversy. And Satan says, I am going to fight that with everything that I have. And so now we have a chapter that more people are familiar with, Revelation chapter 12. This is where we see this great conflict, this controversy that begins in heaven, a war that begins in heaven. It comes to this earth. Michael, who is Christ, wars against the dragon and his angels. And 
the war starts in heaven, it comes to this earth, and it culminates with Satan making war with the remnant of the seed of the woman. And that word war in the Greek is the word polemos, which means it's a war of words. So Satan attacks God's last day remnant church who keep the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus with arguments that, that you may have heard before, such as like, well, nobody can really keep the law of God perfectly, can they? Yet scripture says at the end of time, God will have a people who keep the commandments of God. So then this controversy is between Christ and Satan and specifically at the end of time, God's people are the target and they're a remnant. And so we come to chapter 13 and you ask the question, how is Satan going to work to try to prevent Christ from producing a people who keep the commandments of God at the end of time. And Revelation 13 shows us the two powers that Satan works through. The beast that comes up from the sea and the beast that comes up out of the earth. Now, let's look at Revelation 13. When you look, up at, the, when you look at the beast that comes up out of the sea, we understand that the sea represents the populated areas of the world based on Revelation 17, 15. It has seven heads, ten horns, upon his horns ten crowns, and upon it says the names of blasphemy. And when you look at the beast in verse 2, it looks like a leopard, a bear, and a lion. It has the body of a leopard. It has the feet of a bear and the mouth of a lion. Now, where do we see these beasts elsewhere in Bible prophecy? Daniel chapter 7. And I'm sure you've heard this before, but in Daniel chapter 7, Daniel was looking forward through time. So you see a, Dan, you, you see a lion, a bear, a leopard, and a dr dreadful beast with teeth of iron. He's looking, and then a little horn, he's looking forward. Now John's looking backward, and so he sees a leopard, a bear, and a lion in reverse because he's looking back in time. But in Revelation 13, it's a composite beast. And we understand that the lion represents Babylon, the bear represents Medo-Persia, the leopard represents Greece. Interestingly, in verse 5, this beast, which has the mouth of a lion, it says, there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue 40 and two months. Because you might be asking the question, well, I know that the leopard represents Greece and the bear represents Medo-Persia and the lion represents Babylon, but where's Rome? Where's Rome in this beast? And that's where you look at this mouth and he has a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies and he had power for 42 months and he opened his mouth in verse six in blasphemy against God. So here's what we can say about this first beast of Revelation 13. He has a a composite of the kingdoms of Daniel 7, and he has a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. Is there a power in Daniel 7 that has a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies? There certainly is. And so I want to show this to you, because if you ever give a Bible study to somebody outside of our Seventh-day Adventist faith, this is where you can show this clear connection, the composite beast, the mouth speaking great things. And Daniel 7 makes this very clear. Daniel 7, you have the, the lion, the bear, the leopard, the dreadful beast, the little horn, which plucks up three of the ten horns by the roots. And at the very end of verse 8, you'll notice that this little horn, it plucks up the three roots, it has the eyes of man, and notice it says it has a mouth speaking great things. So that starts to sound similar to the mouth speaking great things and blasphemies in Revelation 13. Then you see verses 9 and 10, and then in verse 11, we see again, it says, I beheld them because of the voice of the great words which the horn spake. So for the second time in Daniel 7, we see uh, this little horn having a mouth speaking great things, but that's not the last time. Then you come down to verse 19 and onward, where Daniel wants to know the, the truth about the fourth beast, and in verse... 20. Again, it says at the end of verse 20, it says, He had a mouth that spake very great things. 
things. So this is the third time the little horn is described as having a mouth speaking great things. Well, it's like, well, what are these great, now it's not good things, but it's like significant things. What are these things that this little horn is speaking? And then you come to verse 25. This is the fourth and final time in Daniel 7 that you see this little horn having a mouth speaking great things. And here's, we, here's where we see the great things that it speaks. Verse 25, And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand until a time, time, and the dividing of time. So if... Daniel 7 mentions that this little horn has a mouth speaking great things four times. Don't you think that's important? It is. And what are the great things that this little horn is speaking? It's, well, look, when we talk in Bible prophecy, we, see, we say that a kingdom speaks how? Through its laws. And what did the little horn do when it spoke? It spoke by changing times and laws and by professing that it had the power to change Sabbath to Sunday. And when it spoke that law into existence, it then persecuted the saints who did not go along with that change. You see that? And how long did it persecute for? For a time, times, and the dividing of time. Now, for those of you who have never heard of this before, you may not be a Seventh-day Adventist. In the Bible, a time represents one year. Times represents two years. Dividing of time represents half a year. There's 360 days in a biblical year. So 360 plus 720 is 1080. 1080 plus 180 is 1260. And in Revelation chapter 13, power was given to this beast. He had a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. Power was given to him for 40 and two months. There's 30 days in a month in the Bible. 42 times 30 is 1260. So guess what? The composite beast of Revelation 13 and the little horn of Daniel 7 are the same power. Rome. And it's the church state power of Rome that we're talking about here. So, here's what's interesting. You know why Revelation 13 is a composite of the beasts of Daniel 7? It's because the church state power of Rome, who we call the papacy, assimilated elements of all of those kingdoms into its empire. Which is why it's called Babylon at the end of the world. Because Babylon is the head of gold in Daniel 2. And scripture says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So the way Babylon thinks guides the thinking of all the kingdoms that come after it. Including the papacy at the end. And the papacy is the composite. So Babylon is the power who says, is this not great Babylon that I have built? And then when God says, no, you're going to be, um, you're the head of gold. But then in a kingdom after you will come along and overtake you, Nebuchadnezzar says, no, they won't, won't, and he built an image, all of gold. So he thought that he could contest the word of God, that's Babylon, going against what God says, having pride to think that you're the one that's accomplished everything. So that was assimilated into the papacy. And the Medo Persia comes along, and they come up with this law that says our laws can't be changed. We're infallible. And then Greece comes along and says, we think that human tradition is better than scripture. And the papacy said, hey, we like that too. And then pagan Rome came along and brought with it the, the worst persecuting power and force that you could ever see. And the papacy said, we like all of that. We like to go against the word of God when it doesn't suit what we like. Our laws are infallible and can't be changed. We think that human reason and tradition can be placed above scripture. And if you don't agree with us, we're going to persecute you and put you to death. That's a composite beast. And they have a mouth speaking great things just like the little horn, thinking that they can change times and laws. So... Here's what we see so far about the first beast of Revelation 13. This is the papacy. It ruled for 1260 years. It had a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, thinking that it could change the law of God. But God cannot change. And to claim that you can change the law of God is blasphemy. Specifically the law that God said to remember. So that's the papacy and that's the first beast. What does this have to do with the Sunday law? Well, 
Let's go to verse 11 of Revelation 13. There's another beast. Revelation 13, 11 says, And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. Now, the first beast comes up out of the sea. That's the populated areas of the world. The second beast comes up out of the earth. Now, I didn't mention this, but in Revelation 13, it says, one of the heads of the first beast was wounded to death. Now, when you go to Revelation 17, you'll come to understand that it was the fifth head that received the deadly wound. There's seven heads. It was the fifth of the seven heads that received the deadly wound. In 1798, Revelation 17 says, five are fallen, one is, and the other is not yet come. Revelation 17 makes 1798 as the dividing line between past and present in the interpretation of that particular chapter. Well, in 1798, when the deadly wound is given to the papacy, the reason why it's a deadly wound is because the papacy as a church power had control over the state. And when Napoleon had the pope taken captive, he was saying the church isn't going to tell France and the ruling empire of the world now what to do. And ever since 1798, the papacy, it may have some influence, but it is not the controlling voice over the state powers of this earth. But eventually, the wound will heal, which tells us that at some point the papacy will have that power again. But Revelation 13, starting in verse 11, shows us how that wound will heal. You have this beast coming up out of the earth. Right around the same time that the deadly wound took place in 1798, you have a, a beast, and a beast represents a kingdom in Scripture. And around 1798, there's a kingdom coming up from an unpopulated area of the world. It's very obvious. The papacy was in the old world of Europe, which was the populated area of the world at that time. And in 1798, North America was the unpopulated area of the earth. Now, if you go to New York City today, you'd be like, this isn't unpopulated. And I got you. But in 1798, go to Manhattan and you won't find hardly anybody. Now you'll find millions. So 1798, you have America coming up out of the earth, but it's not just the United States of America as any other country. It has two horns like a lamb. Who's the lamb in scripture? Jesus. So the principles of this kingdom are based on Christianity. Now, this makes some people uncomfortable. Some people say, oh, you know, you've you got to be careful that you don't promote Christian nationalism. And I would say, yeah, I agree. We don't want to be Christian nationalists. We are Seventh-day Adventists. But it's undeniable that Bible prophecy identifies the United States of America as being based on Christian principles. And this is where I get a little bit concerned sometimes with some of my Seventh-day Adventist friends who think that the Democratic Party is an extension of the third angel's message. Now, let me be very, very clear. The Republican Party definitely is not an extension of the third angel's message, okay? Just to be very clear, neither party is. And I think I made that pretty clear in my sermon today. But there are some people who think that the Democratic Party is an extension of the third angel's message simply because we can show from Scripture that the Christian right in America is going to be foremost in stretching its arm across the abyss to unite with the papacy. And that's undeniable. And so as Seventh-day Adventists, we've always had a healthy fear towards the religious right in America because we understand where apostate Protestantism is leading. But the principles of the Democratic Party today are to say there should be zero influence of God in this country completely, is the way they come across. Now, here's what you need to understand about this, and, I, and I'm saying this in, a, in an apolitical way. The American Revolution and the French Revolution happened within about a decade of each other. Thomas Jefferson was alive to see both revolutions as were many of the American founding fathers. You know what the difference was between the American Revolution and the French Revolution? The American Revolution was based on life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness with an undergirding of Christianity guiding it. The French Revolution was based on 
liberty, equality, and fraternity. Now that sounds pretty good, doesn't it? But the difference with the French Revolution was is that if you didn't agree with liberty, equality, and fraternity, you got canceled. And you know how you got canceled? At the guillotine. You've got to be careful about cancel culture. If you have cancel culture coming into your so-called country of liberty, you don't really have liberty. God is not the author of coercion. God is not the author of force. And so we have to be careful as Seventh-day Adventists to not deny that, yeah, it's true. We understand that the religious right is going to push the Sunday law. We get that. But there is forces in this country that are pushing against God completely. And one of the things that has allowed our country to be what it is, is that it's based on Christian principles, two horns like a lamb. We can't deny that. As Seventh-day Adventists, we should be fighting as hard as we can for America to preserve those two horns. You know what those two horns are? Civil and religious liberty. The other terms for them are Protestantism and Republicanism. And Republicanism is not the Republican Party. Republicanism means that there are constitutional rights for minority groups that the majority simply can't vote out of existence. So for example, the Supreme Court is the highest legal governing body in this country so that you have the legislative, the executive, and the judicial branches. And if the legislative and the executive branches overstep their boundary, at this point we have a a security blanket, if you will, from the Supreme Court, and their job, you know, in a perfect world, so to speak, is to uphold the Constitution of the United States of America. That's their job. Now, we may not always agree with some of the decisions that they make, but here's the point. If the Supreme Court does their job correctly, if, for example, the United States put on a nationwide ballot, we are going to take a vote that bans a certain ethnic group from participating in elections. And for whatever reason, all of the majority, the rest of the majority of America who wasn't that particular ethnic group voted and it passed, say, 53% to 47% in a nationwide ballot that ethnic group X can no longer participate in elections. You know what the Supreme Court would do with that voting result, even though a majority of America voted for it? The Supreme Court would throw that out and say it violated the Constitution, right? Because the civil liberties of that ethnic group had been violated, even though they're a minority group. See, a a strict democracy would allow a majority to outvote a minority group and basically kick them out of having any say. But we're not a strict democracy. We're a republic, a constitutional republic. And so that's why, for us as Seventh-day Adventists, not only do we worry about civil liberty, we worry about religious liberty. And we're a very small minority in this country where we're among the very small group of people that meet on the seventh day. And in a strict democracy, you could have a ballot initiative that said, we're going to ban worship on Saturday. And if you got 50% plus one in a strict democracy, that vote would hold, and then the Supreme Court should rightly step in and say, nope, you just violated the religious liberty of any Saturday worshiping people group, whether it be Seventh-day Adventist, Jewish, or whoever else. You understand that? Civil and religious liberty, those principles come from the Lamb. Those are coming from Christ. And as Seventh-day Adventists, we have always worked to speak out for the civil and religious liberty of all people because we believe in the Christian principle of civil and religious liberty. Now, here's the other point that's worth mentioning, and then we're going to move along here. 
the first power of Revelation 13 is an apostate Christian group who actually receives this power, seat, and authority from the dragon. That's what Revelation 13 verse 2 says. By definition, a power that comes up out of the earth in 1798 that has two horns like a lamb, meaning it's a Christian power, would be a true Christian power, meaning by definition it must be Protestant. So this is Protestant America, not Catholic Europe. The first beast represents the Roman Catholic Church state power who has its seat in Italy. And it was the ruling power of Western Europe for 1260 years. The second beast is Protestant America having two horns like a lamb. But guess what? The last part of the verse says, and he spake as a dragon. Now, if we know how the dragon speaks, we will know then what it means when we say Protestant America speaks as a dragon. And here's what we can say. The first beast, according to Revelation 13, 2, receives his power, seat, and authority from the dragon. And when he speaks, he has a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies during the 42 months that he rules. So when the first beast, he's, he has his power, seat, and authority from the dragon, and when he speaks, he speaks great things. What did he speak? Blasphemies. And Daniel 7.25 says, what did he do when he spoke great words against the Most High? He, he thought to change times and laws. So when the dragon speaks, what does he say? I can change the law of God. Do you see that? That's the first beast. Dragon gives his power and authority to the first beast, and when he speaks, he speaks great things and blasphemies, which is to change God's law. And specifically, the papacy did that by changing Sabbath to Sunday. So the second beast has two horns like a lamb, so everybody has civil and religious liberty, and we should thank God for the civil and religious liberty we have as Americans to worship God according to our conscience. But a day is coming when Protestant America will speak as a dragon. When he speaks as a dragon, how do you, what do you think he's going to say based on how the first beast spoke? He's going to try to change times and laws. And how is that going to manifest itself? It's going to manifest itself by violating the principles of the Lamb that guarantee civil and religious liberty, specifically by changing God's law the way the first beast did it. And that was to change Sabbath to Sunday. But this time, it will be to pass a law that exalts the first day of the week over any other day. Now, see, I've just given you a Bible study without using any spirit of prophecy. You do need to know some history. You need to know what the papacy did in history. But you don't have to have great controversy to prove this. Now, it's very helpful, and I believe in all of that. And you're going to see the quotes here in a minute. But do you see what I just did? When the second beast speaks as a dragon, he's speaking the way the first beast spoke. And when the first beast spoke, he had a mouth speaking great things. In fact, it's mentioned four times in Daniel 7. Speaking great things, speaking great things, speaking great things, speaking great things. And finally, in the fourth time, it's like when he spoke great things, he thought to change times and laws. And so God wants us to see that very clearly. He thought he could change the law of God from Sabbath to Sunday. And the second beast, Protestant America, does that very thing itself. It starts off by allowing us to have civil and religious liberty, but ultimately it will violate all of its principles. As Ellen White says, it will repudiate every principle that it has stood for. Now, some people say, oh, this would never happen in America. Just open your eyes. Man, if you don't agree with the ruling party, you're going to get canceled. And so we're living in an age where um, we have to keep our eyes on what is happening. Now, just to, just to balance things out, I have heard people say, oh yeah, if you got the COVID vaccine, that means that you're gonna get the mark of the beast because you can't, we gotta be careful. Um, 
we, we don't want to take things too far one way or the other, but I do believe that when we force people to go against their conscience in the United States of America while wow, we're living in a new day. So here's what, what we can say. A Sunday law is coming. And for those who mock that idea, it's right there in Scripture. And it will happen. So how is the Sunday law going to play out? I mean, sometimes when you go to certain websites and you talk to certain Adventists, it's like we're going to wake up one day and boom, there was a back room deal cut between the president and the pope. And there's a Sunday law. Whoa. But that's not exactly how inspiration shows us it's going to happen. So what we're going to do now, now that I've shown you from the Bible how we can show that a Sunday law is coming, we're going to go through some stages of the Sunday law. Now, I may not read every slide in my presentation here. I'm just going to hit some of the high points. But this is the introductory slide that just shows you what we're going to show. And what we're going to see is that the Sunday law is going to come in stages. And it's going to start off somewhat harmlessly, but then it's going to escalate <clears throat> until finally God's people will face fines and imprisonment and ultimately a death penalty. So it will start where everyone's told we just need to have a rest day. And then it will escalate to you can still worship on whatever day you choose, but you need to honor Sunday and worship on that day. And then it escalates. You cannot worship on your preferred day of worship, your Sabbath. You can only worship on Sunday. And if you don't go along, you will be fined or imprisoned. And finally, if you don't go along with it, we will put you to death. That's where we're headed. Now, I didn't go through the verses in Scripture, but you can see it very clearly in Revelation 13. You can see that there's the mark of the beast that is received in the hand or in the forehead, and that those who don't go along, who do not worship the image of the beast, should be killed. And you can't buy or sell if you don't go along with this. So the Bible says that this is what's going to happen. I'm just going to show you these statements. So let's look at some, some statements. This first one is from Great Controversy 603, and she's quoting Revelation 18, which is the loud cry. She says, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon, the great, has fallen, has fallen, and has become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. And now this is Ellen White's comment. This scripture points forward to a time when the announcement of the fall of Babylon as made by the second angel of Revelation 14 verse 8 is to be repeated with the additional mention of the corruptions which have been entering the various organizations that constitute Babylon since that message was first given in the summer of 1844. A terrible condition of the religious world is here described. In defiance of the warnings which God has given, they will continue to trample upon one of the precepts of the Decalogue until they are led to persecute those who hold it sacred. So there's a loud cry warning that's going to be given by God's people saying Babylon is fallen, is fallen, but then those who reject that warning will persecute those who give it. And this is another statement. This is Signs of the Times, June 12, 1893, where we again see the loud cry message from Revelation 18. And there's the message, Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, and that you receive not of her plagues, for her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Now, this is rather remarkable. If you look at Revelation 18, the earth is lightened with God's glory. The latter rain has been poured out upon God's people because the Holy Spirit is given to those who obey. So God can say, here are my people who keep the commandments of God. So as the earth is illuminated with the glory of God's character by a people who keep the law of God, how does the Bible define sin? Sin is the transgression of God's law. So when the message is given, her sins have reached unto heaven, what do you think that loud cry message is in response to that Babylon's sins have reached unto heaven? 
they have reached the point where they are violating the law of God all the way to heaven. And what law do you think they're specifically pointing out? The Sunday law. Now, that's just by using some logic from Scripture. Holy Spirit is poured out on those who obey, so they keep the commandments of God. Thus, they give the loud cry message, and they say, Babylon's sins reach into heaven, and Scripture says sin is the transgression of the law. So the transgression of God's law has reached to heaven. How? Through the Sunday law, and that was what Helen White says. When do her sins reach into heaven? When the law of God is finally made void by legislation. Then the extremity of God's people is his opportunity to show who is the governor of heaven and earth. So, there's a prophetic catalyst. If you go to the parable of the ten virgins, five are wise, five are foolish. They all fall asleep. The wise have oil, the foolish do not. The wise have the Holy Spirit. They have the fruit of the Spirit. They have the character of Christ. They keep the commandments of God. The foolish do not have the fruit of the Spirit. They do not have the Holy Spirit, meaning they are not keeping God's law, but they are not part of Babylon. They're part of God's professed church. So there's two, these two classes in the church. And everybody falls asleep so even the righteous are sleeping just before jesus comes back spiritually and then Revel in matthew 25 verse 6 says and at midnight a cry was made behold the bridegroom cometh go ye out to meet him now everybody wakes up now when you study the connection between the parable of the ten virgins and the end of the world the loud cry and the midnight cry of this parable are analogous because when the midnight cry is given everybody wakes up and says the bridegroom comes jesus is at the door he is really here it's time to wake up we're not going to be sleeping anymore and the reason why everybody wakes up is because the midnight cry goes out it's the same thing as the loud cry of Revelation 18. And when Revelation 18 goes out, there's this power that illuminates the earth with the glory of God's character. And the message is given by God's people. Babylon is fallen. Her sins have reached into heaven. She has passed a law that makes void God's law. A Sunday law is passed. Jesus is at the door. Now let me tell you something. When the Sunday law is passed, you might be the most disinterested Seventh-day Adventist in anything church-related, but when the Sunday law is passed, you will know that there's no more guessing games in the history of this world. We're not going to be guessing, well, is it going to be the next president that will be in office when the Sunday law is passed? No, it's this president. They just signed the Sunday law into to the law of the land. Every Seventh-day Adventist will know what it means. And when the Sunday law is passed, everybody in the church is going to wake up and say, Jesus is at the door. And the question then will be, are you wise or are you foolish? Do you have the fruit of the Spirit, the oil in your vessel with your lamp? Or did you think that your grumpy, angry, unforgiving attitude where you lose your temper and hold grudges and play politics would somehow pass for being okay and then suddenly when Jesus is at the door you're going to suddenly turn into being a loving and lovable Christian so when the Sunday law crisis comes everybody in the church will realize this is what's happening and then the loud cry message goes out to the world that says come out of her my people God has his people in the other churches we are not the only people of God on earth but we do represent the true body of Christ and we are to call God's people out of those other bodies into his body at the end. Now some people say, oh, well, if they're his people, then they're doing fine where they are. Why don't we just leave them alone and let them do what they're doing and we'll do what, what we're doing and let's not get into what we call sheep stealing. Are you kidding me? How many Mark Finley's, Doug Bachelor's, ministers of that ilk have stayed in the other churches because Seventh-day Adventists have been too lazy to share the three angels' messages with those people? And it doesn't even have to be someone of that stature. It could have been someone who would have been an effective deacon or elder, and they could have been winning souls to God's end-time truth as well. 
just because there will be a reaping at the end of the world, that, sudden, that doesn't give us an excuse to get out of that work now. And here's the other thing. I hear people say, I'm not going to do evangelism until the loud cry is poured out. Well, guess what? If you don't do evangelism now, you're not going to do it then. Only those who have the fruit of the Spirit who are doing soul winning will do it then. So this is the catalyst. The entire church wakes up. The latter rain is poured out. Notice the statement from Great Controversy 605. Heretofore, those who presented the truths of the third angel's message have often been regarded as mere alarmists. Their predictions that religious intolerance would gain control on the United States, that church and state would unite to persecute those who keep the commandments of God, have been pronounced groundless and absurd. It's been com it has been confidently declared that this land could never become other than what it has been, the defender of religious freedom. But as the, as the question of enforcing Sunday observance is widely agitated, the event so long doubted and disbelieved is seen to be approaching, and the third message will produce an effect which it could not have had before. Man, when the Sunday law issue starts to be agitated, we're going to, by the power of the Spirit, rise up and say, we've been saying this all along from Scripture. Let us show you how and why. So we have a message to give. So let's go through the stages. The first stage will be a proclamation that this nation and the people of this land should refrain from working on Sunday. And I might add that the Sunday law will start in America and then it will spread to the world and become international eventually. But it starts in America. And there will be a command to refrain from working on Sunday. A day of rest will be encouraged. You know, sounds good. Stay at home, stay with your family. And this will even attract the non-religious people because it's, it will be a good day for the environment. But I've heard some people say that environmentalism will be the driving force behind the Sunday law. No, when you study Revelation, you read the statements, man, there's going to be a clear religious element to why this law is pushed. So don't tell me that it's just going to come from the left. It's, it's going to come from both sides ultimately. But Ellen White tells us that this will be a time when everyone's being told to refrain from work on Sunday, that we can then engage in missionary labor. No, we don't go and honor that day as a day to worship, but we can go around and show people from Scripture, let me show you what's happening in prophecy right now. So instead of like going to your job and saying, forget this, if I, like, if I, if I were to stop working on Sunday, I might get the mark of the beast. You know, it's interesting, you may remember E.J. Wagner and A.T. Jones of the 1888 message. E.J. Wagner eventually went to England and there were some Sunday laws, Sunday blue laws in England, and he would defy those laws. And Ellen White actually told him, you're just stirring up opposition and it's not helpful. But we can engage in missionary labor. Now, you know, just uh, as an example of how people on the left will be attracted to this, check out the Green Sabbath Project. In the, on their website, they say, we need a, a Green Sabbath one day every week, do nothing. Take a weekly day of rest, make it a real Sabbath for you, for Earth. Don't drive, don't shop, don't build. So even people who are secular can buy into it if it's done simply from the perspective of a day of rest. But things are going to escalate. And now Ellen White has some statements. She says, this is Testimonies, Volume 9. I'm going to pick up the second paragraph. The light given me by the Lord at a time when we were expecting just such a crisis as you seem to be approaching was that when the people were moved by a power from beneath to enforce Sunday observance, Seventh-day Adventists were to show their wisdom by refraining from their ordinary work on that day, devoting it to missionary effort. And then she goes on to basically say more of the same thing. And so for the sake of time, I'm not going to read all the words, all the sentences, but basically go out with your Bible, do missionary work, and show people what's happening. And then she says, when we do this type of work, we take the whip out of their hands. So during the first stage of the Sunday Law, we can do missionary work that will show that we're not trying to break the law. You know, if you don't show up your, at your business to work, that doesn't mean that you're receiving the mark of the beast. It's only when you honor it by worshiping. Um, so let's move along to stage two of the Sunday Law. So stage two escalates where the law will then be passed along to not only use it as a day of rest, but as a day to honor and worship. You can still observe your Sabbath, 
But at this point, social pressure increases. We call this the little time of trouble. It's not really little. I like the phrase early time of trouble better, really, because this will be a time of great persecution. And at this point, many Seventh-day Adventists are going to compromise because once you start honoring and worshiping on Sunday because you feel compelled to do so, this would be what we call receiving the mark of the beast. Once you go along with honoring and worshiping a day which God has never commanded us to do so in defiance of the Seventh-day Sabbath, this is the receiving of the mark of the beast. Notice Great Controversy 608. As the storm approaches, a large class who have professed faith in the third angel's message but have not been sanctified through obedience to the truth abandon their position and join the ranks of the opposition. By uniting with the world and partaking of its spirit, they have come to view matters in nearly the same light, and when the test is brought, they are prepared to choose the easy popular side. Notice, if we're not sanctified through obedience to the truth when the storm approaches, we'll just flip to the other side. And if you're used to simply regurgitating what your favorite political party says about a particular issue, you might just find that you're partaking of its spirit, and when the test comes, you'll be like, Oh, well, the Democrats are for this too, so I guess I'll do it. I got a little quiet here. But I could say the same thing. Oh, well, if the Republicans are for this, I guess I'll do it. Listen, neither party is safe. Only following God is what is safe. We don't want to unite with the world and partake of its spirit. We don't want to view matters in nearly the same light. We don't want to choose the easy popular side. We want to stand on the Lord's side. Men of talent and pleasing address who once rejoiced in the truth employ their powers to deceive and mislead souls. They become the most bitter enemies of their former brethren. When Sabbath keepers are brought before the courts to answer for their faith, these apostates are the most efficient agents of Satan to misrepresent and accuse them and by false reports and insinuations to stir up the rulers against them. So that's going to be a terrible time when people that we once looked up to turn against us. So that's the second stage, but then it gets worse. Now, not only are you supposed to honor Sunday, now the law prohibits worship on Sabbath. You can only worship on Sunday. Fines and imprisonment will be imposed. And you cannot buy or sell. Now, when it reaches a point where you can't buy or sell, this is where more people will compromise, because we're used to taking care of ourselves. And if we can't buy anything or sell anything, if we can't provide for our family, then the easy temptation will be to go along because it's like, well, I mean, God doesn't want me to go hungry, does he? He doesn't want me to not be able to provide for my family, does he? And that's where things will get tricky. And this is where we have to rely on the promises of God. Bread will be given him as water shall be sure. Because everything is going to be used by Satan to keep God's people from being faithful. And this is clearly where we see coercion being maximized. This is Great Controversy 607 as the controversy extends into new fields and the minds of the people of, of the people are called to God's downtrodden law. Satan is a stir. The power attending the message will only madden those who oppose it. The clergy will put forth almost superhuman efforts to shut away the light lest it should shine upon their flocks. Um, you go on to see it. it says the church appeals to the strong arm of civil power and in this work papists and protestants unite as the movement for Sunday enforcement becomes more bold and decided the law will be invoked against commandment keepers they will be threatened with fines and imprisonment and some will be offered positions of influence and other rewards and advantages as inducements to renounce their faith but their steadfast answer is show us from the word of God our error so that's stage three where fines and imprisonment will be imposed. You can't buy or sell. And finally, we come to stage four of the Sunday law, which is the death decree. We see this in Revelation 13, 15 through 17, Daniel 11, 44 and 45. This is when probation closes. This is when the time of Jacob's trouble begins. This is when the seven last plagues will be poured out. And it is during the sixth plague, I believe, that Satan personates Christ. This is the close of probation. Now, one thing that I ought to mention before I get into the detail of the fourth stage. You know, it's rather interesting that it is apostate Protestant America that pushes 
for a Sunday law. Now think about this. Apostate Protestant America is also described in Revelation 16 and Revelation 19 as the false prophet. In fact, Revelation 13 says that he, may, he doeth one great wonder so that he makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. That takes us back to Mount Carmel when fire came down from heaven, when Elijah demonstrated that he was the true prophet of God. But this time, the fire comes down from heaven, indicating that miracles will be done, suggesting that Protestant America is a true prophet. But the reason why they're not a true prophet is because they're speaking against God's word. Now, here's what's rather remarkable. When you study the spirit of prophecy, Ellen White tells us, that there are going to be momentous calamities that come upon this land that will cause the leading ministers, Protestant ministers of the land, to say, these are judgments of God upon America because we have not been honoring Sunday. And if we would start to honor Sunday again, then these divine judgments against this nation will be removed. And that will then cause the people of the land to call for a Sunday law, and then we go through these stages. But here's something that's worth considering. The three angels' messages, specifically in the first angel, call upon God's people to give the everlasting gospel to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. And that everlasting gospel is found in Romans 1, 16 and 17, which Paul writes out and says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And verse 17 says, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed. Now, you know what the apostate Protestant Christian world says about the gospel? They say, for therein is the righteousness of God declared. There is a difference. The evangelical gospel of apostate Protestant America teaches that righteousness by faith is accepting that God declares you to be just, that he declares you to be righteous, but that your life is still short of God's glory. Yet scripture teaches that those who have faith to believe in the power of God will be so changed from faith to faith, from glory to glory, that the righteousness of God is revealed. And when the loud cry is poured out, or is given under the power of the latter rain, when the latter rain is poured out, the righteousness of God is not simply declared in Revelation 18. No, the earth is lightened with the glory of God's character because his righteousness is revealed in the lives of those who have faith. That's the power of the gospel. And that is in contrast to the beast power who has now passed a law where the sins of Babylon reach to heaven because sin is the transgression of the law and they have passed a law that makes void God's law through a Sunday law. And so now you have those who keep the commandments of God where the earth is lightened with the glory of God's character versus those whose sins have reached into heaven. And here's the remarkable thing. The reason why they pass a Sunday law is because they're saying, they come to the strong arm of the state and they say, you know, as the leaders of the church in this country, we need your help. Now, they don't say it like this, but I'm just using the words that are basically said implicitly. When the church comes to the state saying, can you pass a law to help us to get people in the church so that we can get this nation back on track? This is what the leaders of the church are saying. Our gospel doesn't work. We need your help through the strong arm of the state to get people into line because our preaching through the gospel by itself isn't enough. We need the state to pass a law so that we can get them into church. Yet, Scripture shows that the everlasting gospel through the power of God when accepted by faith is strong enough so that God will pour out his spirit on those who keep the commandments of God. And so the Sunday law is an implicit admission by apostate Protestant America that their gospel isn't strong enough to change the lives of people, so they need a law from the state to force people, to coerce people to follow God, but God doesn't use coercion to get people to accept him. So eventually they become so satanic in their methods that they declare a death decree, and when the death decree is passed, at the end of the Sunday law, 
then probation closes. God's people enter into Jacob's time of trouble. The wicked enter into the seven last plagues. Now, think about this. Everybody is Seventh-day Adventist that I've ever talked to will say, oh, the time of trouble is going to be so scary. It's going to be so hard. And all these horrible things are going to happen. And I, Okay, yes, it's going to be a terrible time of trouble. But if you look at Revelation 16 and Revelation 18, you ought to see what happens to the wicked who receive the mark of the beast. In fact, sometimes I feel like we're, we're priming our young people and even people of all ages to have the mentality to receive the mark of the beast because the way we think, it's like, oh man, it's going to be so terrible, it's going to be so hard, we're not going to be able to buy or sell, we're, we're going to face the death decree, this is going to be horrible, and then people are like, okay, fine, I'll just go along. And so like those out in, in those churches who go along with it, they receive it in their forehead, but there's going to be a lot of Seventh-day Adventists who receive it in their hand, even though in their heart and mind they don't agree with it, the hand represents your actions, and so they go along with it anyway and receive it in their hand, because it's like, I don't want to go through a period of time where I can't buy or sell, but then when you come to Revelation 16 and 18, it's like Babylon's riches go up in one hour or in one day for a very short period of time, and all that people have spent their whole life accumulating goes up, poof, just like that. And those who receive the mark of the beast are the ones who get the bad end of the deal. So we often represent it in not so great a way. So let's go through stage four. This is where people find it rather interesting that Satan would personate Christ. But let's look at this. So this is a statement that talks about death decree. But the personation of Christ, this is the last great act of the drama. It provides the impetus for the death decree. Some would think, well, wouldn't Satan personate Christ before probation closes to win as many as he can to his side? Well, if you look at Revelation and Daniel and all of those passages, you know, the false prophet of America is doing signs and wonders, and it says all the world wonders after the beast. So nearly all the world other than a small remnant is on the side of the dragon. It's on the side of the beast power. And then the plagues start falling, and when you get to the end of the first five plagues, now you've had water turning into blood, you've had the, the boils, you've had river turning to blood, you've had scorching heat, then you have darkness on the seat of the beast with intense cold. I mean, who knows? It, it could get to be three or 400 degrees Fahrenheit. I don't know, I'm just throwing something out there. It might then get to be 200 degrees below zero Fahrenheit. There's gonna be some extreme crazy things that happen during the seven last plagues. And at that point, everyone who received the mark of the beast are gonna be like, you deceived us, we're on the wrong side, we're on the losing team. And so at the beginning of the sixth plague, it says the, the river Euphrates dries up the river Euphrates was the source of life for ancient Babylon and water represents people and the people at the end of the world who received the mark of the beast are the fuel and the support for Babylon in the great battle of Armageddon that will be fought against Christ and his people but they're drying up so then in the sixth plague which is after probation is closed you have three unclean spirits like frogs that come out of the mouth of the dragon the beast and the false prophet the the beast is the papacy the false prophet is the apostate prophet in America and the dragon is Satan specifically representing spiritualism, and this is something we've always believed as Seventh-day Adventists, the threefold union of spiritualism, the, the papacy, and apostate Protestantism. Now, spiritualism we understand, as Seventh-day Adventists, we understand the state of the dead, that the dead are sleeping until Jesus comes, and that those who say that the dead go straight to heaven, we say that that's spiritualism, because that opens you up to the possibility that your dead loved one could come back and talk to you later. And as Seventh-day Adventists, we know that if we see something like that, we know that it's an evil spirit, and we say, get thee behind me, Satan, in the name of Jesus. We understand that. That's definitely part of spiritualism. But Ellen White says in the book Education, page 228, that spiritualism has the philosophy that teaches whatever is, is right. Now, unless you have had your head in the sand for the last 10, 20 years, you will recognize very quickly that spiritualism is being manifest through the modern left. So that you go to a university, and if I were to show up at a university and teach a class on Monday to some secular progressive class on some kind of interesting whatever progressive study they're doing, I could say to them, I identify as a five foot two Asian female. And you know what the class would say to me? 
congratulations, you've arrived at your understanding of your truth. And you know what? That's not the truth. Get out of tape measure. I'm 5 foot 11. I was always mad at my brothers that they hit 6 feet and I didn't. But I'm 5'11. That's just the way it is. And I'm Caucasian. I'm not Asian. Sorry. And I'm a man. I'm not a woman. I might not like any. I, I, I'm happy with who I am. Some people aren't. The point is, is that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And modern spiritualism teaches that you can create whatever truth you want when those truths are really lies, which is satanic. Anything that is not true is a falsehood, and that is satanic. And so for us to say, oh, the left is just going to do what the left does, no. That's part of the threefold union at the end of the world that Satan uses to deceive the whole world. And if you go along with that line of thinking, you're going to be deceived too. And so when we get to the sixth plague, you have the mouth of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, three unclean spirits like frogs. Frogs were the last of the plagues that the Egyptian magicians were able to reproduce. This is the last supernatural manifestation that Satan can do. And what he does is he personates Christ. He does so, point one, to shore up the support of the river Euphrates that's drying up. He's got to get all the people back on his side that have received the mark of the beast so that they will be ready for the battle of Armageddon to go after God's people with the death decree. It's also to try to deceive God's people who have received the seal of God because if he can deceive them, he wins the great controversy. So Great Controversy 624 is the crowning act and the great drama of deception. Satan himself will personate Christ. The church has long professed to look to the Savior's advent as the consummation of her hopes. Now the great deceiver will make it appear that Christ has come. And so you can see that he looks like Christ. Everyone says Christ has come. And he uses the same... He'll sound just like Jesus sounded when he was on this earth. He'll look just like Jesus did. He will perform miracles. But then he will claim that he changed Sabbath to Sunday. That's the crowning act of the drama. But the people of God will not be misled. Um, and so then there's going to be an appointed time. This is towards the end of the sixth plague, leading into the seventh plague, in this fourth stage of the Sunday law, when at one, in one night a decisive blow will be struck against God's people, and they're going to be in all different places throughout the world, some in prison cells, some in hidden places. And just when it looks like God's people are going to be wiped off the earth, all of a sudden, a dense blackness deeper than the darkness of the earth falls upon the earth, and God reveals himself. God's people are going to be delivered. Now, there's a season of distress that is before us. How are you preparing? Notice this statement from Great Controversy 621. The season of distress and anguish before us will require a faith that can endure weariness, delay, and hunger, a faith that will not faint, though severely tried. The period of probation is granted to all to prepare for that time. Jacob prevailed because he was persevering and determined. His victory is an evidence of the power of importunate prayer. All who will lay hold of God's promises as he did and be as earnest and persevering as he was will succeed as he succeeded. Now, while our great high priest is making the atonement for us, we should seek to become perfect in Christ. Not even by a thought could our Savior be brought to yield to the power of temptation. Now, you're like, oh, yeah, that's great. Not even by a thought could Christ yield to temptation. But notice this. Satan finds in human hearts some point where he can gain a foothold. Some sinful desire is cherished by means of which his temptations assert their power. But Christ declared of himself, the prince of this world cometh and hath nothing in me. Satan could find nothing in the Son of God that would enable him to gain the victory. He had kept his father's commandments and there was no sin in him that Satan could use to his advantage. We're like, well, yeah, of course, he was Christ. Notice the last sentence. This is the condition in which those must be found who shall stand in the time of trouble. Now, let me give you just something that's interesting for your own reference. You might want to write this down. Write down Faith I Live By. That's FLB 23, Desire of Ages, page 123. And it matches to Great Controversy 623. All of these statements quote this. Here she says, this is the condition in which those must be found who shall stand in the time of trouble. But in the other two statements, when she talks about how Christ was just like this, she says, so it may be with us. FLB 23, DA 123, GC 623. Rather remarkable. So here's our four stages. 
It starts off by refraining from working on Sunday, then it escalates to you must honor Sunday, but you can still worship on Sabbath. And then it's like, you can't worship on Sabbath, only on Sunday. We're going to fine and imprison you. And then finally, there's a death penalty to, the, to those who worship Sabbath and disregard Sunday, and that's the time when Satan will personate Christ. So we need to know what's coming. Not only do we need to know who's coming, we need to know what's coming. Now, I have a picture on the screen. I've written a book on Daniel. I've also wrote, written a book on Revelation. You can get them from Revenant Publications. It goes through all the verses of Daniel and Revelation, and it makes the study of prophecy practical. You know, we need to know what's happening. And I'm glad that you have people in the ch this church who have a love for the study of prophecy Get together with them. Talk to them. They'll be happy to study with you. You can have Bible study groups, Friday night groups, whatever it is. We need to be studying these things for this time. And so I just want to encourage you. We're just going to, we're going to, I'm going to end it right here, but I want to encourage you to keep studying. I'm going to have a closing prayer for this session. We're going to take a short break, and then I have one more talk. So let's, let's pray as we close. Father in heaven, thank you that you've made things clear for what is coming, and thank you that we can know who is coming at the end of all of this. May we be faithful to you and ready when Jesus comes. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Norman. Uh, we're going to take about a five-minute break, and then the rest of them will come right back. Uh, so let's do at 3.55. It's 3.50 now. We'll see you in five minutes. I think that's now they've